Thank you so much. Uh, sorry if that was traumatizing. I, I had forgotten how heavy that was. I really, you know, you get in the edit and you, you desensitize with that. Oof. And to the siblings, for the Mailer family that's here, that's tough stuff. Thank you. Uh, for I, us make on behalf of all my siblings, <laughs> we're all thoroughly traumatized by you, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. As if living it wasn't enough. Yeah. You had to put it together in that way. Y your dad assigned this to us. He said to go as low on the roller coaster as possible and as high as possible <laughs> and to reach for those extremes. Um, so that, that was the challenge, and I hope we, hope we did you uh, proud. I, I, I think I can speak for all of my siblings, uh, who I believe at this point eight-ninths have seen it. Um, everybody's very grateful to you because uh, we, we really do feel that you captured an almost uncatchable life in an hour and a half and gave it the nuance and the honesty and the love that you always bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Buffalo. Appreciate that. The, uh, the only challenge bigger than telling the story of a man like your father was figuring out which bites to use because we had over 30 of the most articulate, best storytellers. I mean, all poets and writers, everybody's an artist, including 150 siblings. Uh, so th that was a huge challenge as well. Um, so apologies if you didn't get enough screen time to any of our 30 plus interviewees. Um, Absolutely. So should we open up to questions? Does anybody have questions? Sorry, I could not find it. The, uh, the project originated when, um, when John Buffalo and his sister Danielle reached out to Stu Schreiberg, who's a producer who's here tonight uh, somewhere, and myself, uh, and said that the uh, mailer's centennial, what would be his 100th year on this planet, was coming up, and they were willing to share for the first time their personal archives uh, and their stories. And... Um, it seemed like an impossible task, which is exactly why Vicky and I jumped in to do it. Because yeah. um, it, it, it is, you know, the number one rule of narrative filmmaking is that you root for your protagonist and you sympathize with your protagonist and you at least like your protagonist. And, um, well, unless it's an anti-hero, I see your face there. Uh, and um, we said to Buffalo, you know, the one prerequisite of making this is that it's got to be warts and all. It, it's it's um, it's got to be no holds barred. We we're going to paint a portrait that reveals the ugly and dives as deeply into that as into the, the beautiful. And um, Buffalo said, "Yeah, my dad would want it no other way. I mean, this is you know a provocative person, and so therefore the film has to be provocative. Why don't you start it with the stabbing?" Uh, of Adele and I was like well that's a good way to lose your audience and no one will root for him for the entire hour and 40 minutes and then of course that's exactly what we did because it seemed like that's what Mailer would, would have wanted us to do is to make the dangerous choice um, and you know really push the bolder more unpopular approach um, so you know Vicky and our editor Alana Burns who's here tonight um, and Buffalo and Stu and everybody that worked on it was real, really advocating for not taking the easy way out, not making the easy choice um, throughout the edit. Uh, and there's a million chapters of his life we left out, but I think we intentionally chose the tougher ones um, and tried to make our equivalent of a very uncomfortable mailer film for you. Absolutely. We, I'm Vicky, the producer. Um, I think we all really wanted to be as true to Mailer as possible. And um, I think that hopefully those who are here who knew him felt that and feel him come through in this film. Vicky said early on, we have to make a film that Mailer would, would appreciate, that Mailer would applaud. Um, you know, we, we ultimately don't need to love Norman um, to benefit from his ideas, and we don't need to hate him to learn from his mistakes. Um, and uh, that was our sort of North Star. That, that was the guiding light through this is, you know, we have a love-hate relationship with difficult people and difficult ideas. Like how can we wrestle with that, um, create a good tug of war where you feel both sides of that equation? Is there nothing else out there in the audience that we offered once? Okay, there we go. That's how we 
fantastic job, everybody. Um, question on how you approach the score. Oftentimes, as filmmakers, you don't want the music to be wall to wall. You want to kind of drop in and let it breathe. This was wall to wall, but it worked. I mean, we were leaning in. You're just like, it, it was chaotic. It was kind of madness, but I felt it was very fitting. But just very curious about the process of the score. Sure. Uh, I'll speak to it first, and then you can jump in, Vicky. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the freedoms of this film is that it can be denser. Like, so often as a filmmaker, you're pushing to show more and tell less and be more disciplined, um, clean it up, be concise. And in this case, the substance, the, the subject matter is the complexity, is the layers. And that's not only true of the ideas, that's true of the aesthetic. And so it gave us, that was an invitation, I think, to layer it um, and build to levels of intensity around ideas. You know, so often that's a, a sports montage or a, a musical number if it's a music doc. And in this one, it's, it's ideas. There's, it's the writing. Um, so we saw our montages where you're hearing the clack of the typewriter as the equivalent of, um, you know, of our montage uh, invitation to go crazy. And we had a great composer, uh, Jacques Bratbar, um, who was really experimental. Um, we turned down a lot of weird ideas and we embraced, I hope, a lot of weird ideas too. I'm thinking in particular of our sequence in the 1950s where Baylor is experimenting with drugs and I think, and also the Maidstone section is some of our most experimental music in the film. Um, just very bizarre, unexpected score and I think we're trying to capture uh, the chaos that Mailer was going for during those times in his life with the music. Very well said. Doing a quick scan, yes, I see you there. Here. Um, I thought he was more involved in the civil rights movement. I didn't get that from the film. Am I mistaken about that, or? Do you want to speak to that, Bobo? Yeah, that's all Jeff's fault that uh, that doesn't come across better. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of challenges in terms of condensing Norman Mailer's life into any uh, time that you can actually expect an audience to sit and watch. So I think the first cut was like 17 hours when you sent it to me. and. Um, we looked through, we thought, this is great, but no one's going to sit down for 17 hours in a movie theater. Um, so there was a lot of elements that we couldn't get in there. And it's kind of a, it's a wonderful problem, right? There's just too many moments of the second half of the 20th century and into our own time that are there. But one of the reasons why uh, I was so taken with, with Vicky and Jeff and their take on this is they said, look, we want to do the life, but we also really want to focus on why are Norman Mailer's ideas so relevant to today? Why is it that this is a life worth examining? Uh, aside from the fact that he was famous, that he won Pulitzer, that he did all this stuff, there's, there's a lot of amazing lives out there. Why do we care today? And that angle really just blew me away. And the two, the, these two people and the amazing team that came together around them dove into so many hours of footage, so much stuff, and really, uh, for, for my money, cultivated that answer as to what it is that this man was on from the time he was a young man to the time he died that still speaks to us today, that still cares about us, that still wants us to grow or else pay more for remaining the same. One of the things we talked about a lot early on is that if Mailer was alive today, he would double down hard. Like he would be, he would be pushing back against the currents of polarization and uh, political correctness and technology overtaking the written word and bite-sized ideas overtaking the complexity of ideas. He would want us to make him a scapegoat. He would want his ideas and his life to be used to provoke and to agitate um, and to be contrarian at this time. And so it did feel like an opportunity to take ideas of his that were vital and push them out there and hopefully you know, provoke us to ask smarter questions and, and come up with smarter answers. Um, and so by the end, I think it was important to us that we, we sort of refocus, uh, we recenter our, 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 our attention on the prophecies of Mailer and what he would have wanted us to do differently today. Uh, and that, you know, out of that came 
this concept of how to come alive and uh, in the chapter headers. Right, and also focusing throughout on Mailer's personal struggles. And there were, I mean, through the seven decades that he was in the public sphere, so many things were happening and he was commenting on all of them up until um, his dying day. I mean, he was very vocal about uh, the military and the United States and what was going on in the Middle East. There's so many things that he was commenting on. We could have made like a 10 part series, but we really focused on Mailer's internal journey to wake up and come alive and hope that, you know, through his complicated life, people could take something from that for themselves. Got time for one more out here. I'm gonna go here. No, go ahead, yes. Okay, as his daughter, Danielle, uh, I just wanna say today, um, today he, he, he died 16 years ago today. Oh, wow. So this is his uh, she said he died 16 years ago today. Yeah. And um, thank you for that film. It brought him back to me in the most extraordinary way, and I'm very grateful for the two of you. Thank you, Danielle. Jeff, Buffalo, we'd love to give you guys the, the last word here. And if there's anything you want to say, especially about Norman's legacy here for a film that's going to live on for years to come. I, I, I feel like I still hear him talking to me every day about what's going on today. And frankly, if he were alive, I wouldn't be surprised if I got like 10 minutes of a heads up of, by the way, I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing a sparring match with Trump. Yeah. I'm going to get into the ring, see if he's really tough or not. Um, I, I just couldn't be more grateful to the two of you for, uh, for doing this. And one of the most amazing parts about the whole journey, too, was the conversations we had about what is the world ready for? As we look over history, as we look over the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, the sensitivity of today, what is the world ready for about Norman Mailer? And the, uh, as he would say, his highest virtue is courage. And I think there's incredible courage in the two of you to take this year of your lives and to put this together and to put it out there. And I, I, I hope the world hears you. I hope so too. Thank you, Buffalo. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you coming out.